Hey, Scripties, it's just Lexi coming at you from the future again. I just wanted to drop in and let you know, but before we jump into today's episode talking about the funeral directive, that one of the scenes in the show does involve showing a baby's body being prepared for burial. Um, We discussed that on the podcast today between 8 minutes and 30 seconds and 11 minutes and 15 seconds. We just wanted to flag that in advance for people who may not want to hear that topic discussed. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to Script in Hand, the podcast where two friends and theatre directors delve into plays and talk text. How are you diddling, Meg? I'm good. How are you, Lexi? What's your week been like? I mean, I have now just come off the end of Fringe, mm. so I now know what day it is again. Um, I've, I've, l- I've re-got my sense of time back. I mean, it's, it's stupid how you just, you lose all sense of what day of the week it is, what time it is, and I now know I'm back. It's a Monday. <laughs> Life makes sense again. I bet you're pretty tired as well, are you? Oh my, mate, it was the replacement buses that did me oh. in, so uh, so for Script East, no, um, my company, we commute in daily to a fringe from Carlisle, because y'all know I can't afford those accommodation costs. As the BBC <laughs> reported. Uh, oh, do, yeah, such a weird, I'm sorry, it was such a <laughs> non-story. We had, we got it. such a, we... We got such media interest, and it wasn't even about the show. It was about, gosh, you're coming in every day from Carlisle. And then when I told the BBC News, "Good morning, Scotland," and everyone, <laughs> it's an hour, it's an hour and ten on the train. It's it's really not as bad as I think you think it is between Carlisle and Edinburgh. And I was like, oh no, that's not that far. No, it's not, but thanks for the coverage. I and just... we got some audiences who came off the back of having seen the interview. Oh, so. really? That's I mean, that's a good reason to do it, isn't it? I just find it hilarious that it's like, breaking news, Lexi Ward commutes to work. <laughs> like... <laughs> That's fine. We will take the publicity where we can get it. But yeah, the replacement bus services were were less mm. fun when we were coming back, especially the, t- the driver who got lost in Lockerbie. We went in and out of Lockerbie three times, oh and I was like, goodness. "Please, just take that road. Take the road. Oh. Take me home, country roads." <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> How about you? It's been three weeks since I've seen you. What's new? Yes, What's diddling? a busy, busy week at work. We had Sean Paul in, so that was a lot of fun. Ooh. Yeah, so it's been a really busy week, so I'm very tired. I actually didn't get up till half two yesterday. Uh, my body good ju- Lord. Yeah, that's how tired I was. I think my body just flopped. But I'm all good now. I'm refreshed. It's a bank holiday, so I haven't done anything. I've just been chilling, which is just lovely. I'm ready to get back to work. And ready to record a new episode. Oh, yeah. So, what are we doing this week, Meg? And it's published by Nick Herm Books, and it was the winner of the 2018 mm. Papatango Prize for New Writing. It premiered at the Suffolk Playhouse in London on October the 31st, 2018. Halloween play, whoop whoop. It's, oh, not, yeah. it's not nothing to do with Halloween, but I just really <laughs> Absolutely appreciate not. it. Absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah, not in the slightest, but I just really appreciate that it premiered then. And it went on tour in a co-pro between Pack of Tango and the English Touring Theatre in 2019. It was chosen as the winner from 1,384 wow. entries. Amazing. So, uh, Funeral Director follows a married couple um, called Aisha and Zaid who own a funeral parlour. And one day they have Tom come into, the, into their business who wants to have a funeral for his uh, partner and because he's gay there's there's a kind of a, a question there about whether their religion should allow it um, and where that kind of stands which kind of kicks off the whole play and yeah leads Aisha into confronting some things for herself. Yeah there's that conflict of um, whether religious beliefs trump um, the human rights essentially. Yeah exactly. Rights for all. Um I found it really interesting. I was reading an interview with a man from um, Culture Calling on what sparked her idea for the mm. play. And I, I don't know if you, if you remember this news story, uh, Meg, but she says, it came from several places, one of which was the gay cake row in Northern Ireland, where a man walked into a bakery and asked for a cake that said something about gay marriage and the bakers refused. And it I went all the this. way up... Yeah, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court... Um, where eventually it was ruled in legally in favour of the bakery. Um, so that's where it kind of it came from. And and I really enjoyed, appreciated this little quote from Iman about her play 
although views are criticised, I don't think people are vilified, and that's really important. Mm. It's important when fighting for change that we listen to each other and understand each other rather than polarising ourselves. Yeah, no, I get that. It is It is a play where you it, it leaves yourself kind of thinking which is the right kind of way to go with it and which is not. It's It doesn't come down too harsh one side or another. It yeah. does feel like it's, op- it's open and you can see... You can see the thought process behind what would normally maybe be a circumstance where we'd go, oh no, they're in the wrong. Yeah. It's very, it, she's done a really great job in balancing out mm-hmm. our understandings of the characters and their beliefs and what might lead them to these decisions they make. Yeah, which is also helped by, there's another character called Janie, who is a human rights lawyer. Um, so that also plays into it as well. And then you later find out that she's also um, gay as well. So that character, I think, just to put into the play to kind of add to that morally questioning. So a bit on Iman. Iman is an award-winning writer for stage, screen and radio. In 2018, she won Paptango with The Funeral Director. And her latest play, The Ministry of Lesbian Affairs, great title, Mm. opened at the Soho Theatre just very recently in May 2022 and is at the time of us speaking a nominee for Off West End Award for Best Performance Ensemble. Amazing. She's writing a new play for the Almeida Theatre as part of the inaugural Genesis Almeida New Playwrights Big Plays programme and is also writing new plays for Papatango, the Bush Theatre, English Touring Theatre and the Royal Court, so another busy bee. Mm. Um, for screen, she is currently adapting the funeral director for television mm. and the Ministry of Lesbian Affairs with NBC Universal. And she was previously selected by Film London for their London Calling short film slate with her short Home Girl, which was also selected for the 2019 BFI Flare Festival. So lots of strings, lots of bows, and lots of exciting TV adaptations of her work coming up. That is really cool. I can definitely see this as a TV adaptation. So that's really exciting. I'll definitely be watching that when it comes out. Asian Culture Vulture Review called it a tough, tender and extremely moving play Mm. and the stage calls it a sensitive and nuanced exploration of sexuality and the Islamic faith. Mm. This is just a side note, but I think Iman is one of the best playwright websites and blogs I've ever read. <laughs> I was doing research, and I just got so suckered into, like, she posts really regularly about what she's doing. Amazing. And so if you're listening, I really hope the, the London Brighton bike ride went well, and I hope that doesn't come across <laughs> weirdly stalkery now, but it's such a really personable blog <laughs> from a writer. amazing. I think that's great as well, because as a writer, the best thing you can do, obviously, is get your voice out there, so why not have an amazing blog that people can get to know you better on? Here, here. Well, on that note, on the subject of getting to know Iman and her work, shall we dive into the funeral director, Meg? Yes. Okay, so I want to start with how this play starts. Uh, heavy. Interestingly enough. Really heavy. <laughs> really heavy. Really so heavy. So the curtain opens, and the first action you see is uh, Aisha preparing a baby's body for a funeral. Yeah. And I think that's so interesting that she's chosen um, like to do a baby's body instead of an adult body, because that feels... It feels more immediate mm. and really... Oh shot! Uh, oh god! Wow! Yeah, of course that kind of that obviously happens, yeah. but it, it yeah, as an audience member, that must feel really oh sh- shit. As, <laughs> I'm like, doing. especially as an audience member who isn't a funeral director or doesn't work, you know, with death. I think it really is just such a stark reminder, especially given how their reaction to it isn't. Oh, this is such an abnormal situation to be in. I think the f- mm. the first note I wrote down when I was reading this play was, whoa, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, it, it does remind you that funeral parlours are a business and yeah. that Aisha is kind of very business-minded. Yeah. Um, because Zaid says, well, inshallah, we won't get any more babies today. And Aisha says, you better hope we get someone in if this month has been slow. So mm. there's not... There's obviously the concern and the care for for the the child they're burying or preparing for burial but it's very much a well business is business and we need bodies i think that sets the stakes quite high though doesn't it because ultimately this play is about well it's kind of you've got uh, how the stability of well stability of the marriage is rooted in the business and then you've also got this Mm. kind of situation where the business has been sued and it really does remind you straight away like you say this is a business and straight away you know like those stakes are really high 
I went and had a look at the Southwark Playhouse website for this um, mm. for the page on this production, and you know where it has content warnings. Yes, they specifically say that this play contains a uh, depiction of preparing a baby's body for burial. So they really spell it oh, out. Sometimes God. in content warnings, you don't get that. You get uh, some upsetting scenes, mm -hmm. and they really specif specified. Which I think is actually really important. You have to. Absolutely. This could be incredibly, yeah, it could be incredibly triggering for yeah. for someone, and we don't we don't know what audience's circumstances are. So I think fair play to Playhouse for um, for when they staged it for being that direct with that what the show contained. That transparent. It did make me think, like you say, it's a it's a business, it's and it's a family business that Aisha is inherited from her mother, <laughs> who's passed away. And I did wonder, I wonder how many female funeral directors there are. Yeah, I um, thought this. I thought this. Mm. And what I thought was really nice is kind of throughout the piece as well, it is very much her business. Mm. You know, that it's not like, oh, she married and then it became the man's business. No, I agree, because he, he used to work for her mum. Yeah. Uh, supporting her mum. And then, even though obviously he probably... She'd been around the business a lot. He probably had more direct experience mm -hmm. while she was growing up in it. When she inherited, she be it, they do refer to it as her mum's business, and she says, "My, you know, I'm working for my mum," mm -hmm. and it, it feels very much like she is the the one in charge almost. It's certainly in the relationship, mm -hmm. um, um, and it, yeah, it's it's interesting to see that kind of dynamic play out. I think it's important to be reminded as well i think when you kind of come to this issue of um you know you have a gay man coming wanting a islamic funeral it's also not just about aisha's opinion on that because there's a lot of references to well what would my mother have done how would she have handled that um which i think you have to remember as well because it's not just about this one character's opinion there's a lot of times in plays we talk about the characters who aren't yeah on stage but who will make whose presence is really felt and i think that's this is one of those plays where both aisha's mother and Janie's mother we never meet them but they have such a strong impact on on the characters and the world of the play i was thinking about uh, it was jane it was aisha's mother's business first mm. and we know that she was uh, a si re raising aisha single-handedly um aisha's father wasn't on the scene and so I thought that's a really interesting choice then as a, a single parent to be running a funeral mm. director. I've, I've imagined, I was thinking why go into that profession, but I've, I suspect it's, it's because it's relatively stable. Yeah, I mean, people will always die. <laughs> I think one thing that really struck me about this play was it was so easy to read. Sometimes mm. I find myself, when we when we obviously read plays a lot, uh, you and I. Um, sometimes um, it's okay, right? Read a bit, put it down. Read a bit, put it down. Or you know, it's kind of like, oh, come on, you're nearly at the end. But with this one, I read it far enough in advance. I didn't have to read it all in one go, but I did. And then I think about like forty-five minutes later, I'd, I'd finished it, and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's just such an easy read. Like it really does read so well. And I think that's down to the fact that it's mainly set in one location. And you've only got kind of the, the three core characters. Um, yeah, and I really liked that. Which I think is why when you said it's going to be a TV adaptation, I was like, yes, I can absolutely see that. Because it just plays out so well. It's such a a visual text to read. You can really imagine imagine the play just from reading it. I think the thing I'm kind of most struck by was we we're talking about um, how m maternal and paternal relationships are a real theme throughout mm. this and what we do kind of for our parents or or in the case of Aisha, what, what she thinks her mum would maybe want because she married Zaid after her mum died, which I found really interesting because... Yeah. So the whole thing with Aisha is she's coming to terms with or she's been shutting a large part of herself away for many years so she is gay mm. um and she comes to say that out loud by the end of the play um there was always something there between her and Janie um but they were separated basically by Janie's mum by circumstances and also it was never really said out loud or acknowledged because it would have been really, really frowned on mm -hmm. by Aisha implies by her, her community. 
and that's why she refuses to allow Tom to bury his Muslim partner with them because she thinks it would really negatively impact the business by having a, a gay relationship with them. And so I thought, yeah, it was interesting. Why, why did she marry him when there was no one really there to please? Her dad's not really mm. on the scene by the sounds of it. Her mum had died. I wonder if it's just the kind of overall pressure of the community and I feel like yeah her mum's no longer there but there will have been a lot of people around her who knew her mum and still that level of expectation especially with her running the business it's not like her mum's died and she can then go off and live this new life where there's no kind of connections to that um I would imagine I mean luckily thank god my mum's still here and if um I was running a business that she r ran you just that's just such more much more of a link even though yeah. they're not present anymore and she needs the business really to tether herself to Zaid if they were yeah. to jack it all in which he, he, he proposes early on in the play he says let's just we you know we're still young let's just sell it and go and do whatever we want but she really needs it as that barrier between the two of them it's a protective wall it's like when you don't have when you can't speak the truth to someone you need something that you're both invested in as a diversion and that's what it is constantly yeah. and she can't be herself with him i mean she says on page 44 is like this is my choice it's my mum's business and i choose to keep it going for her it's like well, this is only part of the truth though isn't it no, no. really <laughs> really if you if you jacked it in i mean, imagine she must be terrified of well, that like, prospect of doing that what would they talk about well exactly yeah they they have very few conversations in the play, the two of them, which aren't related to work, related to the lawsuit that then Tom subsequently brings when they do refuse his service. Until um, the very last conversation that they have, really. Oh, it's such a lovely conversation when she's finally truthful with him. Mm. I mean, he, kn he knew the whole time, didn't he? Did he? I think so. I think that's why his reaction... <laughs> I think that's why his reaction to Tom coming into the funeral... Is it a parlour? Funeral parlour, would you say? Um, yeah, let's go parlour. Yeah, that, I think that's why his reaction is so strong. And then Aisha does make reference to how uh, Zaid is such a lovely, kind person and would do anything for any members uh, that came into their business, you know, would sit down with them, talk to them. And then out of nowhere, he has this incredibly strong reaction... Um, to someone being you gay. See, I'd, I'd, you see, I'd say his reaction's probably the more tempered of the two at start, certainly. Mm. Um, especially when he first comes in, because she's the one to shut down Tom's request, which True. is really interesting. She says, she says, I'm sorry, we can't help you. What? We're too busy at the moment. So she's really brusque with him, mm. and Zaid's a bit more gentle. He says, what's your name, mate? He calls him mate. Listen, True. Tom, why don't you go to Freddy's? Frederick's and son after other side of town. You know it, they'll sort it. They're really good up there. So he feels more compassionate, mm. certainly at the start of the play, but he goes through a real gambit, you know, from this quite happy, gentle man you do see at the start to this really... to someone who's imbued with sarcasm and fear and then anger, and then just really broken by the end. I mean, mm. it's a it's a cracking little part for someone mm. to really run the emotional gambit. It kind of is, over such a short period of time, you do see the decline of the marriage even before you get that conversation about Aisha being a lesbian. You can see that it's obviously breaking down, even though you kind of know why, but kind of don't know why as well. So I think mm. he really is desperate in a way isn't he like he really really loves her mm. and uh yeah i think he's a lovely character as a character have we really come across one like aisha who is so closed off not only from other characters in the play but to the audience and to herself mm. she gives very little away through a lot of the play mm. until that final conversation so it's interesting how you're central character is someone it's very difficult to almost connect with but for completely the right reasons because she's not being open with herself she mm. can't be open with the audience or with anyone else until she kind of ad admits how she really feels i do think she's so she's such a strong character as well though like, i would say that for me strong is kind of the word that sums her up which is strange because in a way she's not 
being completely herself right until the end, but mm. I do think, yeah, like you said, she's very interesting. The most emotional, I mean, in terms of language that Iman uses is when she finally does say, Zaid asks her in that final conversation, what does it feel like? And she mm. says, like a fire raging through me, screaming, just screaming to get out. And that's the... Sh- that's such a sort of powerful imagery mm. um, as to how she's feeling about suppressing her feelings and sexuality all this time. Mm. I wonder, it must be incredible to watch this play as someone who isn't able to express their sexuality within the community that they're in. It's really nice that this play was supported on its original run by a couple of foundations, um, but one of them being the Maz and Nat Foundation, where Matt Ogson, who runs it, says because it, he supports it because it is really important for more people to understand the true impact of religious cultural homophobia. Yeah. So it's organisations which are d- specifically created to try and help people in those circumstances um, with either coming out to their community or understanding their own sexuality and and helping the the communities around them still support them um so it's it's lovely that it's got a real it's a play which has a real cultural impact i think and has the potential to and hopefully on like that, that, that tour um they got the chance to to kind of have that i think it's really nice to hear this from a woman's perspective as well because i feel like i'm trying to think of all the books i've read films i've watched TV shows I've watched in which there is a gay character from the Muslim community and I think it's probably always been a man but I actually think this is the first time where you have an Islamic woman who is gay that I've personally read. It was just nice, like I just felt like that's a story I hadn't heard and whether that's like me not reading the correct things and it is out there or it's, I don't know, it was just like, oh, I've not heard this before. Oh, well, you might like this. Iman said in her statement after she won the Papatango, she said, When I wrote a play about a gay Muslim woman who runs a funeral home, I did worry that theatres would see it as too niche, to even put it in front of an audience. But we should never feel our stories don't have value. Mm. Winning this prestigious national prize reaffirms the fact that even stories deeply rooted in a specific culture or community have the power to appeal to our shared humanity. Well, that's just a quote, isn't it? I know. Far more eloquent than we <laughs> far, far more eloquent than we'd ever put it. I know. <laughs> Me going, yeah, it's nice to hear it from a woman's perspective. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I feel like Yeah, why is why is the story of a lesbian Muslim feel niche? It shouldn't. There's obviously mm. millions of people out there that relate to that. But yeah, I mean, it's sad, but amazing that it has been written down. I think one of the most powerful bits for me in that, we keep coming back to this final conversation, but it's a really great part of the play when she's having this final discussion with and honesty with, with Zaid. It's the first time she really shows him affection throughout the play. It is, yeah. Yeah, so after she's told him the truth and is her realist self, she says... Um, he says, I love you. And she says, I love you too. And it's the first time she said that. And she says, we'll be fine, my love. We'll be fine. And she hugs him. And she can now say those words, but not have them like laced with lies mm. or, you know, denial. But if I if I give too much of myself to him, then he'll... It, it's, it can't ever be as reciprocal as he's wanting. And she's kind of been lying to herself or blocking it. But now that she's told him, she's... She can be, it's now true, but it's a different kind of love. Yeah. Um, and she really does care for him, but she, now she say now she can give that to him as honestly as she can. And I think that's really beautiful. It's saying it without the expectation of children, <laughs> which is obviously mm. a big thing at the start of the play as well, is Zayd wanting children. What do you think of the aisha Janey relationship? Um, I think it's great. I think... I don't know for you, but for me, it was quite obvious where that storyline was going to go. Ooh. Do, I don't know. Like, when it, it was kind of written... So, Janie, when she kind of says she's a lesbian, I was a bit like, well, yes, obviously. <laughs> I think the relationship is richer for having it be someone from Aisha's past... Oh, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of galvanises 
the change almost in her than because she could they could have just brought in another female lesbian yeah. uh, lawyer sorry female lawyer who was a lesbian and have her spark in a way there but having it someone who's so deeply rooted to Aisha when she was a girl a child a teenager immediately puts you at that sense of ease and you get immediately a really like you say I think it is quite obvious where it's going but maybe but in a in a beneficial way because yeah. it's so clearly indicative of the relationships Aisha's got with the two characters in comparison. You compare her with Zaid, where she's constantly closing herself off. There's this little bit on page 43. He says, maybe we could get dancing lessons together. And she says, as if we have the time. We could hire someone to help. You need a woman for the female ghouls. So we'll hire a woman. Good luck finding one. So she's constantly shutting him down. And then by comparison, she's much more relaxed with Janie, which speaks to their... Um, shared history mm -hmm. and she's she's making jokes which we don't really ever see at page 34 she says ah oh, do you only eat posh london biscuits now and she goes oh yeah yeah each biscuit cost at least six pound <laughs> asia well good better stock up <laughs> so yeah. their relationship is really obvious but in a in a nice way that speaks to their shared um, relationship i also really appreciate that it's not about their relationship and it's not aisha suddenly realizing she's got massive feelings for Janie and them getting together and you know mm. i mean whether they end up together or not is kind of a question at the end but i like that it's not obvious oh we're a couple now because i feel like that's that's not the story the story is about aisha finding herself and realizing that kind of yeah, with the help of Janie and kind of through her, but it's not because of Janie, which I think is really important because then it's like, if it had been that, it wouldn't have given the leverage of, you know, you could as a reader, you could have been left thinking, well, is she a lesbian or does she just love Janie? Um, so the fact it's like, no, I am a lesbian and it's not about mm. Janie, I think is really important. Yeah, because that's, that's a great story, but it's not this story. Hmm. They clearly, I mean, this is talking about the influence of Janie's mother earlier, and Aisha says what kind of led to them splintering as a friendship yeah. all those years ago. I think it's 11 years, I think it is. Um, Aisha said of her mother, she said you were being bullied because you were only hanging out with me, and she wanted you to spend time with girls you have more in common with, who shared, in quotes, similar upbringings. And the implication there is she wanted to spend time with... White straight girls, yeah. white girls who weren't Muslims, potentially one, both, or all of those. And it just shows a, a prejudice as a foot. Um, it's ironic, I think, given that they actually did have very similar upbringings. Yeah. Jamie also had an absent father. And they were always together as well. Like As kids, they were, you know... They say, they say about how Janie was always at their house. and They say, page 57, Janie says, We were so bullied and the school did nothing. Nothing. People were taught that it was okay to hate us, and we in turn taught to hate ourselves. Those scars run so deep, and I can still feel them today. Mm. And it's interesting, because it's, it's, you don't get the sense, I wouldn't have said that, kind of from the character you meet at the start of the play, of Janie, that she's someone who's carrying um, this trauma from her past. No, because I think she's... She's moved away, hasn't she? And doesn't have that strong connection. She, you know, she's moved to London where she can just kind of do what she needs to do and she doesn't have to be tied to that trauma and that past, whereas Aisha is very much literally running her mother's business. So, Yeah, so that idea of being stagnant in, yeah. in a circumstance, even if you've moved on emotionally or you've grown older, there's constant reminders mm. of the places, the scenarios where you were... Um, all around you. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's it's interesting that, that Janie went on to be a human rights lawyer fighting for those who were persecuted, um, given she was a victim of bullying herself. I found that a really nice little touch. Um, I no. I feel like that's probably quite common, to be fair. I feel like you would need a bit of fire. Yeah, and to and to really empathize with your clients. She does say I I mean, I don't know about you if you kind of relate to this sort of idea of when you come back home it's somewhere <laughs> you've been raised um but she's obviously back visiting her mum who's had a fall and Janie says this is a long quote and I'm going to give it to you all in its entirety because I love this little monologue it's about London fantastic. and then coming back home it's fantastic um 
show of London, a melting pot of cultures unified by suits and mobile phones, commuter woes and house price grievances. And you know that falafel is Palestinian and your Muslim mates can only eat halal meat, but you can also go to that kosher place up in St John's Wood and you feel like you've got superpowers, like you've cracked it and the answer to war and hate, racism and homophobia and the clash of civilizations is just to become a Londoner. And now I'm back here and it's home, but it's like... Uh, a twilight zone, like suspended in space and time, the same prejudices, the same divisions, the same small-minded, small-town backwardness that I'd hope I'd left behind. I mean, yeah, I do. I 100% relate to that. I think especially having just left Carlisle to live in Leeds, I mean, <laughs> Leeds is incredibly multicultural and that's exactly what I wanted. You know what I really enjoy about this? Um, it's a really small thing, but I really love... Uh, the British act of tea, and how it's <laughs> the, both the first time and the last time we see Janie. Um, mm. She's handing out tea. Yeah, yeah. Um, she, you know, what once at the hospital with her mum, and then at the end when Aisha is packing up the funeral home, having made the decision to to move on from it. Um, and the last line of the play is, "You nearly done here?" Aisha looks around the home. Yes, I think so. And it's t it's finally her being able to move on. But I just like, ah, tea. Yeah. Suitable for all occasions. It is, isn't it? It's that thing where um, it's like, are you sad? Have a cup of tea. Are you happy? Have a cup of tea. Do you need comfort? Yeah, it really is. Tea. It is just so, so British. Um, One of my favourite scenes <laughs> is when um, Zaid buys Aisha the vibrator. <laughs> oh yeah it's just so random and so funny um yeah so because they've been not intimate with each other for a while and it's Aisha's birthday Zaid thinks well that he buys her a vibrator and then it comes and it arrives way bigger than he expected and he kind oh. of he tried to, <laughs> it's so funny I love that in this it's such a serious play we've got this hilarious scene um and then he tries to hide it behind the cushion and she's like no what is it what is it and then she gets it out and she's basically like why the fuck have you got me this <laughs> I yeah just it think... turns awkward really freaking quickly <laughs> yeah, it's just so funny oh. uh... it... You do need a bit of that light brevity in, yeah. in, 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 in every serious play. Absolutely, you know. Fun being the props apartment, hunting for that one. <laughs> oh, goodness me. See if this play ever tours internationally. I don't know how they'll get that through customs, but I guess that's... A... Oh, my... And on that <laughs> note, <laughs> on that question, we will, we will end this discussion. Amazing. So yeah, the funeral director. I can I see exactly why it won the Papatang. Oh, know, gotcha. I think it's exactly what Iman says in her statement afterwards. It's about giving that voice to what is a a very potential potentially niche um, community, but one which so deserves a larger platform. And I am certainly richer for having read read the play. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure it's a play that had a genuine impact mm. on those who saw it. I feel like yeah, it's an important read, and it's one again, that I've learned a lot from and I would really mm. recommend people read it. And like I said, it's an easy read anyway. It's like, it's just a lovely book to read. Yeah, I mean, how often... It's one of those mysterious jobs, like funeral director. We don't... Yeah, yeah. Very, we very rarely yeah. come into contact with that world, I hope, you know, throughout our lives. Mm -hmm. There are very few occasions. And we'll never see kind of really behind the door unless mm -hmm. it's, on, it's in a fictional format. So it's really interesting to, to kind of see... To see that and then to hear about how that differs between different uh, religions as to how bodies are prepared. So, yeah. So here's Lots a good question. Um, let, let us know, listeners, if there are any other plays about funeral homes or funeral directors. Yeah, why not? Because um, I don't know of any. The TV show Six Feet Under, and I've only ever watched episode mm. one, and I keep thinking I should watch episode two, but so it's meant to be a masterpiece, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> you'll get there, you'll get there. So what are we doing next week? Episode five. We are doing Squad Goals by Michelle Payne. Yeah, and Michelle's going to join us. Mm -hmm. She's going to be great. So exciting. I'm so excited for this one because it's all about uh, female footballers. And given the year our amazing Lionesses have had, it seems a great time to put this play about that into the forefront of our consciousness. And it's got an amazing like choreograph routine in the middle of it. it. This is what I think is really cool. So we'll talk about this a lot next week. But Squad Goals premiered 
as an outdoor promenade performance in a football stadium. Amazing. That's what we want. It was one of the first plays to be performed um, after kind of venues were semi-opening during lockdown. Mm. So it was one of the f- at the forefront. So I'm so excited to talk to Michelle about this play. Mm. Bit groundbreaking then. With the football boots. Oh, that was terrible. I'm trying to think of football boots breaking ground. I don't know how sports goes. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't uh, help. I cannot help. Kick off. <laughs> um, so, as always, peeps, listen up to all of our fun admin section now. You can find us on Patreon. We have a Patreon. Yay! You can give us £3 a month. It really supports the development of the podcast. You get some bonus content on there. It only lasts for the time we're actually recording, so... Yeah, come and join our Patreon Cool Kids Club <laughs> and get our merch. What mer- merch have we got, Mary? Oh, we've merch. got stickers, badges, water bottles, mugs, tote bags, T-shirts, phone cases. And I think that's it, but that's a lot. <laughs> and we've got two different designs. Oh, show me the sticker because you've got one this I week. Have. You've got one. It looks so cool. <laughs> I love it. It looks great. I'm going to get a t shirt. I keep saying this. I need to order myself one now, fringes, and I want to rep some merch. Absolutely. Um, you can find the links to our Patreon and to our merch on either of our Instagram and Twitter pages. Just look at our little link tree thingy. I don't understand how it works, but we have one. <laughs> look, look there for all your deets, and you can follow us on all the socials at Script in Hand Pod, or drop us an email at Script in Hand Podcast at gmail dot com. Let us know your thoughts on the play, the episode, um, what plays you want to see us cover in the future. All the fun things we love to chat. Absolutely. And let us know if there are any other plays about funeral homes, because I'm quite keen to read them. A bit morbid, but okay. <laughs> That's a niche Meg's now really interested in for her fit <laughs> discovery. You want to read us out with a, a quote from the play? Yes. A stage so, direction? Given the scene we've uh, just spoken about. Oh, I'm, I'm scared. As we unwrap it and see what it is, a huge vibrator, we'll see you next week. <laughs>